If you've been following this channel, you'll know that I've been slowly working my way through the Revolutions podcast by Mike Duncan. And every time I finish a season, I turn on the video camera and ramble for a while and, and give my thoughts on what I've just listened to. Not because I have anything intelligent to say, uh, be warned ahead of time, but uh, just because that's what I do on this channel. I, I make it a point to try and talk about everything I read or watch or listen to, and, and that's what we're doing here. So I, I say this every time, but be warned ahead of time, there's no intelligent commentary here. But that being said, uh, I just finished season six, uh, The July Revolution, otherwise known as The Revolution of 1830, and I'll just talk through my feelings or thoughts on that season. I absolutely loved this season. Uh, this was like everything I wanted this podcast to be. Uh, it was so interesting. It was very informative. It was well told. It was well paced. I, I, I've got a couple quibbles here and there, which maybe I'll get to later. But on the whole, boy, this was expert storytelling about a subject I thought was very interesting. Uh, in fact, I, I think I mentioned this in the first video I ever did on this uh, podcast series, my started video, that uh, before making a project to listen through this podcast systematically, I had been dipping in and out of it for a while. And uh, the revolutions, Revolution of 1830 is something that I had listened to uh, just casually uh, at work um, for a, a, a week, uh, you, you know, because th there's a lot of content there. It's not something you listen to in a day. Um, back when I was just kind of experimenting with dipping in and out of this podcast and found it so fascinating that it, I think this is one of the main reasons I decided that I definitely had to make a project, had to make it a project to systematically work through this podcast. Now, uh, I, I do wonder uh, that perhaps a lot of my love for this season is just uh, just because it happens to tickle my particular interests and maybe other people would find it less interesting. I don't know. Uh, so uh, l let me back up maybe and, and give my interests in this. I, I think like a, a lot of Americans, uh, you know, l let me know what your experience is. Correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, I never heard of the revolutions of 1830 when I was in high school. Uh, it was not covered in my history classes at all. It was uh, not until I got to college and only because I was a European history major uh, in college uh, that I found out about the revolutions of 1830 in, in a survey history course on modern European history. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said in my initial video on the, on the Revolutions podcast, I found that whole period fascinating. Uh, the, the idea that there was all this revolutionary upheaval in Europe in the 19th century, not just the French Revolution, but this whole series of revolutions once every 20 years. Uh, um, and uh, the, the revolution of 1830, how it, I, it was kind of like uh, a, mini, a miniature 1848 uh, in that there was an uprising in France and then it spread to several other countries. Not quite as big of an explosion of 1848, but it, it still kind of fascinated me, these waves of revolution. Uh, I, I mean, um, the other... The other interest I had in it is, is around this same period, and again, I think I mentioned this in my started video, although I don't remember everything I rambled about. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was reading the Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. And again, I, I think I share this in common with a lot of people. Um, when I first started that book, I didn't clearly understand the historical context behind it. And maybe things would be different nowadays with the internet as it is. Uh, I mean, we had the internet back in the 90s, but it was, it was not the internet of today by any means. No Wikipedia, anything like that. Um, so yeah, uh, n not initially understanding the initial, you know, because I, I think Mike Duncan even mentions this at one point in his, in his podcast. 
A lot of people, when they see the Broadway play of Les Miserables, they assume that it's the French Revolution. And then you learn a little bit more history and you're like, oh no, that, that wasn't the French Revolution. And then for a while I thought it was the Revolution of 1830. But then you actually read the book and you notice that the Revolution of 1830 comes and goes in the middle of the book. It's, it's very briefly mentioned, but it is mentioned if memory serves. It was some 25 years ago now I read the book. I, I'm long overdue for a reread of it, but anyways. Oh, actually, while I'm mentioning it, uh, just hold this up here. This is my wife's copy. Uh, it's in Vietnamese. Um, she, uh, she read it a couple years ago on my recommendation. I myself am long overdue for a reread. Uh, read it 25 years ago. But uh, yeah, uh, the, when, when you eventually kind of place the, the barricades in Les Miserables as two years after the revolution of 1830, I, I was really very fascinated by it at the time and would gladly have read more about it, except I never seemed to find any books about it. I mean, there's a ton of books on the French Revolution. There's a few books on 1848. I, now, now uh, granted, I, I never looked very hard. So, you know, of, of course, if you walk into Barnes & Noble or uh, popular bookstore or whatever, it, it's, you're not gonna find a book on the Revolution of 1830, are you? Um, but it, it was something I would gladly have gone into more depth about if if books had been at my fingertips at the time, but I, I didn't. I never found anything about it. Uh, which is why Mike Duncan's whole season on it, and he, he calls it like a, a, a mini-series, like it's a short season, and, and uh, yeah, granted, Compared to his normal seasons, I guess it is quite short. Uh, it's a couple prologue episodes, then three episodes on the actual revolution itself, and then a series of epilogue uh, episodes in which he wraps up loose ends. But it's certainly more detailed than I think you're likely to find anywhere else. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, I am impressed by how much detail Mike Duncan has been able to uncover. Now, granted, he's a much better researcher than I am, and he's at this point doing this as his full-time job. But it's it's interesting looking at his bibliography, which you can see from his website. Uh, there's only one book on there on the Revolution of 1830. That's um, David Pickney, The French Revolution of 1830. Uh, from uh, Princeton University Press in 1971. All the other books on his bibliography uh, are books that cover the period, uh, but not, not the 1830 revolution specifically. So, so I guess that indicates that it is just hard to find books on 1830 specifically. Um, which, given that, uh, you know, I think, I think it's worth acknowledging that Mike Duncan has really created something of value here, um, cr created a popular, accessible narrative of the Revolution of 1830. Now, granted, it's in audio form, so you know if you don't like podcasts, it's not accessible. But for those those of us who like who listen to podcasts, uh, the you know, I, I mean, when it, when it comes to the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or something like that, there is tons of stuff out there. But this, I mean, before Mike Duncan did this, uh, what, what accessible things were there on the revolutions of 1830? Sorry, Revolution of 1830. Um, yeah, yeah, I... I, I very glad he made it, and I found it completely fascinating. Um, now, he, here's where we get to the part where this may just be my uh, idiosyncratic interest, but uh, this kind of ticked all the boxes for me. Uh, I'm, I'm, had been, ever since college, very interested in revolutionary 19th century Europe. I am less interested for, I don't know, whatever reason, in the revolutions in the colonies. So the American Revolution, the Haitian uh, Revolution, the Spanish-American Wars of Independence, 
which are seasons two, four, and five, respectively, in Mike Duncan's podcast. You know, I'm glad he made them. I'm glad he listened to them. It was all well done as far as it goes. But that's that's not my my main interest. Just kind of following the the, the story of uh, revolutionary Europe is, is what I find most fascinating. And here we are, right back in the thick of it. And he, you know, right from episode one, he's getting into the politics of the Restoration Monarchy. And uh, this kind of political background, I just find fascinating. Um, now, I, I'm not a scholar, so I suppose I would have a limited tolerance for getting into it too in depth, but the level of detail that Mike Duncan covers it in is just perfect for me, and I, I suspect for a lot of people. You know, it's in depth enough to be interesting, but but not too in-depth, you know, the narrative keeps moving. So, uh, now, uh, yeah. I, I think there are different types of history nerds. Um, there, there are some history nerds who are more fascinated in military history. There are some history nerds who are more fascinated with social history. Um, but th this kind of, uh, the, 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 I, I, I'm fascinated by uh, the political history of the early modern era, um, the, where, where we have the, the modern ideas just emerging uh, and clashing against the old style conservatism. Uh, and it, who knows why this fascinates me, but it, but it does. Um, so I, I can easily imagine where other people might be less interested in this if, if it's not their cup of tea, if they're interested in, in more military history or something like that. But if you are interested in this stuff, then this is just perfect for you. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, there's that old uh, reviewing, what is it, a saying, an, an old saw where a, a reviewer will say, well, if this is the kind of thing that you like, then this will be the kind of thing that you like, right? Meaning that, uh, that there's a certain type of people who will be attracted to this, and th those people don't need any convincing uh, that this is going to be interesting for them. And and this is, I think, a good example of this. If, you, if you're interested in this stuff, then you're going to be really interested in this stuff. Uh, and if you're not, then, then you won't be. But if you're at all interested in this period and these politics, uh, it's, it's really well done. I, I know I'm getting repetitive here, but I, I did warn you at the start of this video that the commentary wouldn't be that intelligent. So, um, yeah. Uh, Maybe getting into some of the nitpicks here. Uh, so, I, I, I say this every time, but the, the, the way I listen to podcasts is mostly in the background. Where uh, if I'm getting distracted by something, I will lose attention for some points and then I'll come back to it when, when I refocus my attention. Um, and to make up for that, I do listen to each season three times before I give a review and, and uh, usually uh, usually by the end of those three times, all, most of the pieces have fallen into play. Uh, the, the parts where soldiers and barricades are moving around a lot though, I think that is, um, that's less suitable for a podcast form, at least for me. It, it's difficult to kind of keep this all in my mind while I'm just kind of casually listening to it. Now, uh, if I was listening to this and just sitting there and listening to it, you know, staring at the wall and listening to it, which I um, I imagine some Mike Duncan listeners do because uh, some of his audience seems to be very carefully following him based on the, the comments he gets, uh, then, then perhaps it would be a, a different story. Uh, he does it this on this podcast say he made a Google map of the streets and the barricades and the, the soldiers which you can go to. Uh, but I didn't even bother. Um, in, in the past, I've made an effort to try and track some of this stuff down on his website. His, his website is not great 
for searching through the archives. In fact, it's terrible for searching through the archives. I wish he would redo it. Um, and plus, you know, I'm listening. I, you know, it, it's the uh, podcast is on in the background. You know, I'm I'm walking. I'm listening. I'm cleaning. I'm I'm doing other stuff while it's playing. So I'm I'm not tracking down a Google map. Um, but yeah, I, 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 do, I do somewhat appreciate the level of detail he gets into. And as Mike Duncan himself says, uh, in previous revolutions, you're going, uh, the previous revolutions that he's covered on his podcast, we're going for a more broad sweep of history. So there's not time to get into the nitty gritty barricade street fighting. Um, but here, because we're just focusing intently on three days, the three glorious days, he, he allows himself to get into it. Uh, an, an interesting little uh, historical trivia, something I, I think I knew at one point, but I had kind of forgotten about, uh, is the Revolution of 1830 is where we get the barricades from. Uh, everyone thinks that the barricades, the French Revolution, and again, maybe that's uh, a, a legacy of people confusing Les Miserables with the French Revolution. Uh, but um, the, the barricades, as Mike Duncan says, barricades kind of were in the French Revolution, but, but not really. Uh, it's 1830 uh, and the subsequent revolutions where, where we see the barricades. Um, in my youth, when I was 20, 25 years younger, I was absolutely fascinated with uh, the barricades and the street fighting and perhaps the overly romantic view of these kind of things which are presented in novels and musicals like Les Miserables. Um, I'll, I mean, I'll talk to the, about the Paris Commune when I get to the Paris Commune um, in season eight. Uh, but uh, I remember reading the history of the Paris Commune by Oliver Lisa Gray, in which he, he gives a, a fairly street-by-street -street view of the barricades and, and the street fighting, um, and found that interesting at the time I, I read that. Uh, over the years, I've become less interested in barricades and street fighting, and uh, I think some of that is just growing older and, and losing your romantic view view of uh, these kind of things. Uh, and I also, uh, you know, have read somewhere that uh, testosterone levels in men declines in middle age, which is where I am now. And I, I think, somebody let me know if I'm getting my science all wrong here. But I, I think a, along with that uh, comes sort of a, a decrease in our fascination with violence. Uh, you, you know, young boys and Teenage boys uh, are fascinated with fighting and violence. Now, I've I've always considered myself a pacifist on an ideological level, on, on a rational level, on, on the sense where I know that violence is wrong rationally. But at, on the subconscious level, the id or the you know the dark impulses underneath you, I've always been fascinated by stories of violence, superheroes fighting bad guys, Zorro, that kind of thing. And uh, I, I think the, the idea of this fighting in the streets against the soldiers up on the barricades um, is, the, is the type of thing that's more fascinating when, when you're fascinated by the, those scenes of action and violence. And then uh, as I don't know. I, I'm I'm get, I'm I'm talking outside of my area of expertise and hypothesizing on uh, biology and evolutionary biology that I don't. I'm not really an expert in, but uh, that that's roughly my understanding. Um, as, as you get older, you're you're kind of less fascinated by the idea of fighting and, and street fighting and stuff like that. So uh, I I think the the, the amount of detail that Mike Duncan goes into about where the barricades were and how the street fighting played out in the revolution of 1830 is something that would have fascinated me more 
25 years ago when I was overly prone to romanticize this kind of thing. Um, as, it, as it is now, I, I find it interesting, um, but, uh, but I guess what really fascinates me is the whole, the, the, the whole political thing, you know, the, the, the policies of the restoration government, the, um, the, the liberal opposition, uh, how this played out in the chambers, etc., which, which Mike Duncan tells very well. Oh, speaking of which, uh, Adolf Thiers, uh, Mike Duncan's portrait of him is really interesting. Now, uh, I, I think a, a couple years ago when I was listening to this casually, as I mentioned before, I think that was the first time I realized uh, Adolf Thiers was so involved in the revolutions of 1830. I knew, I knew he, had, he was involved in the revolutions of 1848. Um, now, Adolf Thiers uh, is going to be the big bad guy in the uh, revolution of 1871, the Paris Commune, where he, he will represent the forces of reaction crushing the Paris Commune. But it's it's interesting to, I don't know, maybe, now that I think about it, maybe I did pick up at one point his history in 1830, but I, I did not know about it in depth uh, before listening to this. And I don't think, I, I'm pretty sure I never knew uh, what Mike Duncan says is that he was the protege of Talleyrand. Uh, now, if you're interested in the Paris Commune, you're supposed to hate Adolf Thiers, but uh, it's interesting that Mike Duncan says he, he really loves him or, or finds him interesting because he was uh, a, a historian and because he was a protege of Talleyrand. And it's interesting to see, I mean, I, I've, I've read so much stuff on the Paris Commune, it's interesting to see the, the, the young Thiers in the um, revolutions of 1830. It'd be interesting to, to see um, Mike Duncan's portrayal of him in 1848 when I get to that. So uh, all, all of that was interesting. Um, yeah, the, the, if, if I had maybe getting into the quibbles here, something I thought, one ball I think got dropped a bit is the uh, idea of the wave of revolutions of 1830. Um, because I, I, my impression, and this is just based on the survey courses I took back at university, I, I never was an expert on this, but my impression is in 19th century Europe, whenever there was a revolution in France, it kind of spread out in waves. Uh, I think there was a saying, when uh, Paris sneezes, all of Europe catches a cold, or maybe it was when France sneezes, all of Europe catches a cold. Meaning every time there's a big revolutionary upheaval in France, in, in Paris, then all of Europe was in trouble. And of course, this was this was very true in 1848, but um, I think it was true to a lesser degree uh, in 1830. And there was, what was this? According to Wikipedia, uh, there was, uh, I think, a uprising in Poland. Uh, yeah, the Italian states, Portugal, Switzerland, uh, all followed this. Um, now, uh, Mike Duncan does talk about Belgium, to be fair. I, he, he does a whole supplemental episode on Belgium. Although, um, you get the, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't connect the dots with the wave of revolution so much, although it's mentioned briefly, briefly, excuse me. Um, but yeah, the, the, the other ones I would have liked, I, not, not, not a whole season, obviously, but maybe just an episode uh, talking about the broader waves of the revolution. Like uh, maybe you could put Poland, the Italian states, Portugal, and Switzerland all together in one supplemental episode, just kind of briefly touching base here with, with what's going on. Uh, I suspect the reason that he didn't want to do that is because he, he doesn't like 
telling stories if he doesn't feel he has the room to tell them fully. Uh, he, he, he doesn't want to be like a, a textbook. He wants to be more of a storyteller. Uh, which I suspect is also the reasons why he's uh, skipped the revolutions of 1820. Uh, although, um, I, 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 you know, in season five, I, I kind of mentioned that that was another one of my nitpicks that I, I wish he would have done more with the revolutions of 1820. But by the time you finish season six, he, he's touched based with the revolutions of 1820 enough times that you 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 can't accuse him of omitting it. Uh, he's he's talked about the revolution in Greece and how he skipped over it. He's he's mentioned uh, the revolution in Spain in 1820 multiple times by the end of season six. Uh, the the uh, he has a whole supplemental episode on the. Um, Carbonari in Sicily, which which is 1820 again. Uh, I mean, I guess the only one that... Well, the, the, there's a Portugal revolution, but again, he, he touched base with that briefly in season five, so he, he's... He's touched on them. Um, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things. Part of me wishes there was an alternative universe in which Mike Duncan had done a mini series uh, on the revolutions of 1820. Uh, like not necessarily not necessarily a whole season for each revolution, but just a, a, a mini series kind of touching base with each of them. Um, but the, the other part of me uh, wonders that if he had done that, if I would just complain about it, um, you know, if it would, because, because the stuff I'm really interested in is the main revolutions uh, going on in France and Central Europe. And, and I think that's the stuff Mike Duncan is really interested in as well. So he wants to get back to the center of the action in France with 1830 and then again with 1838. Um, yeah, his supplemental episodes. Um, so after finishing with the revolution of 18. 30 in episode 6.7, he does a series of uh, supplemental episodes, uh, which he calls uh, 6.8a, The Fate Accompli of 1830, when he talks about what was happening in the rest of France. Uh, I thought, I, I wasn't so interested in that one. I, I, I thought it was, I don't know, uh, just kind of a long list of things that were happening in various other towns and got away from the main thrust of the narrative. At the same time, I'm kind of glad he did it because it, it was important stuff to cover. Um, the Belgium Revolution, which I'm very glad he covered, and that was a good episode. Uh, Metternich. <laughs> now, if you, if you listen to this, uh, you know that uh, the pronunciation of Metternich is something that he talks about a lot. Uh, he, he says that he's going to pronounce it Metternich uh, because of his German fans, but then it turns out uh, that he, in, the, in the next episode he has to apologize because apparently he's not pronouncing it right. So I'm just going to avoid all that and just go with the traditional English pronunciation, Metternich. His episode on Metternich was absolutely fascinating. Uh, the Carbonari. So th this is where we get to the episode in 1820. So, sorry, the episode which he covers the uh, revolution in Sicily in 1820. Uh, and I, you know, I just got done saying how I wish he would have done more with the revolutions of 1820. But I have to admit, I... Didn't find this episode all that interesting. Again, I'm glad he made it. I learned some stuff from it. I thought it got a little bit too bogged down in the description of the secret societies. And then when we actually get to the broad sweeps of history, there was too much information crammed in there that I didn't quite absorb or couldn't quite follow. And again, part of this is because I was passively listening to it. So yeah, maybe... <laughs> I, I complain that he doesn't cover 1820, and then when he does cover it, I, I complain. Uh, the, 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 there's no pleasing me, I, I know. Um, I, I, I'm glad he made the episode. Uh, but the, the ones I found absolutely fascinating were the Belgian Revolution, the ones on Metternich, and then the final uh, supplemental, 
uh, the June Rebellion, which is about 1832, the uh, revolution, well, not the revolution, the um, mini barricades that were portrayed in Les Miserables. Um, and uh, yeah, it, the, the, the point he makes in that episode is that uh, it was not a revolution. It was a attempted revolution that failed miserably because nobody joined the barricades, which, which was why uh, Victor Hugo uh, decided to use it as the backdrop to his novel because we needed a, a tragic revolution and not a triumphant revolution. Uh, I, I, it, needed, it needed a tragic end. Um, but it, th that whole thing, and, and again, I, I say this as somebody who, had, who has long been interested in the portrayal of, of the barricades in Les Miserables, the, the way Mike Duncan tied that in with Victor Hugo and said Victor Hugo was actually an eyewitness to this and nobody would remember this if, if it wasn't actually for Victor Hugo, uh, and then uh, goes through the whole political evolution of what happened between 1830 and 1832. I, I mean, by the time he actually gets to the barricades of uh, 1832, there's only like five minutes left in the episode. So most of the episode is just leading up to the conditions that produced the, the June Rebellion in 1832. But it, it's, it's, still, it's still fascinating. Um, Really enjoyed that, and uh, yeah, you, you know, I mean, it, one of the things, it's been 25 years since I read this book, so my memory might be faulty, but I do not remember Lafayette being talked about that much in this book. Certainly, um, certainly I think in the, in the Broadway musical, Lafayette does not get mentioned, right? So I, I mean, th there, there's this, the, the kickoff in the musical for the revolt is the, the funeral of Lamarck, which, which uh, yeah, Mike Duncan talks about. But I, I mean, I remember um, watching the musical or reading the book and, and, you know, because Lamarck and Lafayette sound kind of similar, at least to my ear, they, they both start with a la sound. I, I, I kind of got them a little bit confused or thought, I, I, I had misremembered uh, the revolution, the, 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 that scene in Les Miserables as being inspired by Lafayette's funeral instead of Lamarck's funeral, and I had been wondering where Lafayette would have been in all of this. So, so to, for Mike Duncan to kind of tie those threads about Lafayette's involvement, or, or I guess it's really kind of a non-involvement, but the, it, Lafayette's biography, into what was happening in 1832. That, that was really interesting. Um, you, you can see quite clearly in this whole season where the seeds of um, Mike Duncan's biography on Lafayette are, are emerging. Um, I think he, he's, he says later that uh, once, once he kind of finished the 1830 revolution. He was going to do a, a retrospective on how Lafayette had been so influential in all these revolutions, but then uh, turned that into a book instead. But yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's interesting kind of all these figures from the French Revolution, uh, Talleyrand, Lafayette, uh, the, the, how do you pronounce his name? The Comte d'Artois, uh, Louis XVI's younger brother, uh, survived the French Revolution and then go on to, to become major players in the uh, Revolution of 1830, some 40 years after the, the big events of the French Revolution. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll wrap things up here. I, I could probably talk more about all the little details I found that were so fascinating in here. But... Um, I don't really need to, huh? Uh, this is the type of thing that recommends itself. If, if this is the kind of thing you like, then this will be the kind of thing you like. Uh, you don't need me to persuade you to check it out, but check it out. It's really good. And 
I am so looking forward to season seven, The Revolutions of 1848. This is another period of history I really find fascinating. I've dipped into it a little bit when I was casually listening to episodes of this podcast, but did not did not systematically work through it. So I'm really looking forward to, to see what Mike Duncan does with 1848. And that's, I'm going to start listening to that right now. So on, on to the next season.